Let's get to those top picks. It's an oil name, Canadian Natural Resources. Look, our belief is you need to find big structural themes that have gone through some shift and then things can be revalued. And we know that when asset classes or sectors go through many years of underperformance, when they ultimately wake up, they can put on pretty good returns. And the leaders in the group do even better. So when we look at oil and gas, the oil and gas sector went down 90% from 2014 through 2020 mm. and ultimately reversed trend mm -hmm. and you know recouped a bunch. Um, uh, if you look at CNQ, CNQ in the very long term chart, you know, basically made a new high about a year ago and then has consolidated over the last year during the tightening cycle. So this is a company that generates just a boatload of cash. They paid down debt. They've got very long life assets. They pay a great dividend. In the world that I talked about where you want to own the lender, this company generates so much cash. You're going to see 20% dividend growth off of off a very significant dividend to believe begin with, probably a 20% earnings growth or cash flow growth. And I think the multiple can double over the course of a cycle. So you do the math on that, uh, you're going to get a pretty solid return. This could be a core holding, I think, in any Canadian portfolio. Tech resources, uh, play on metals. This is, a, this is a similar thing. You know, commodities went through a bear market from 2008 through 2021. And through the Fed's tightening cycle, certainly have chopped sideways. And you can see it in tech's, mm -hmm. tech share prices. But if you pulled the chart back to, you know, like a 20-year chart, you're going to see that, you know, we're, we're basically at the cusp. And you could look at Rio Tinto or a bunch of others. They look the same. I think going forward over the next couple of years in this next economic cycle we're moving forward to, these companies do well because there's been no money spent. Their, their CB2 mine is coming into production. They said this, uh, December, January mm -hmm. have been pretty smooth. They're going to have good production this year in copper. Next year, the copper production will double. And again, the cash flow generating capability of these two companies are going to be great companies for dividend investors who want some inflation protection. Although they have had cost overruns of that QB2, but I guess everybody has on their minds. Yeah, yeah but you know, you want to buy companies as they are coming into production, mm -hmm. as they've worked out the kinks, and this is where this company is now. Okay, and then the final idea, you mentioned Japan earlier, um, EWJ, uh, iShares Japan ETF. Yeah, again, a, com uh, a country that went through a 40-year bear market, 30-year bear market, uh, and has clearly come out. It's been a very consistent performing market over the last year. Uh, the Japanese yen has been stabilizing. That's important. If you don't believe in the Japanese yen, you can buy DXJ, which is currency hedged, okay. back to US dollars. Uh, but this is a, a great way to play it. This is an inexpensive market that's dominated by financials and industrials. Warren Buffett has been a huge buyer of Japanese stocks over the last year for the first time in many years. Uh, and we think this is a great diversifier. Canadians in general, don't have a lot of exposure outside of North America because mm -hmm. global stocks have been tough for a long time. But when they start to work, they can work for a decade and really can provide some significant portfolio support. We think this is a, an interesting holding as a diversifier. I'm just looking at the top holdings here, uh, Toyota, Sony, uh, but then Mitsubishi Financial and uh, Lots of electronic companies. It's amazing how the Japanese have held on to their electron, uh, their industrial companies. Yeah, they, they have, and they've restructured. And the Japan, the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange said about a year ago, you have to do something to start trading above your book values, or you risk being dis delisted. And in Japan, when people have a rule, they follow the rule. Oh yeah. So they've all been out trying to take restructuring uh, initiatives, and uh, and it's the the market is behaving exceedingly well. Okay, top pick number one, we straightened it out. It's Polaris Renewable Energy, PIF. Um, what do they do, Alex? So they're a uh, producer of electricity in South and Central America, produced from green sources, uh, geothermal, run a river, hydro projects, uh, solar, wind, and uh, produce about five different countries now in, in South and Central America, and it's... Uh, uh, just a very inexpensive producer of electricity and uh, cheap stock, 15 times earnings, 6.4% uh, dividend yield, mm. trades at a discount to its competitors. 
Um, they used to be in Costa Rica, I think, where they have, actually have volcanic uh, heat. I'm not sure if they're still there. No, no, uh, not or Costa Rica. Ni Nicaragua? The original, Nicaragua. Oh, yeah. sorry, okay. Nicaragua Next was door. the original project. And that's, you know, part of the reason the stock trades at a discount is, is you know, people said, oh, Nicaragua, the San Denise, this, this okay. or whatever. But that project's been up and running for 10 years, and the, the, the government has never missed paying them once and so uh, you know it's a it's a good key infrastructure for the the country and so and since since that time that was the original project they've moved into like Peru and uh, Dominican Republic and uh, Panama and and Ecuador so uh, you know again so people go okay riskier political jurisdictions but you know as opposed to mining these these are much more popular projects with the population because mm -hmm. the population benefits and they don't really call, like they're green green power projects so the actually displacing diesel generators and that sort of thing so the the uh, very popular with the local population mm -hmm. yeah mining uh, not popular in places like Guatemala it seems yeah, yeah. Uh, Pfizer is your next idea so, and this this is interesting. So, uh, you know, they just reported uh, this morning. I think it stocks up a little bit now, uh, but it's 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 been horrible over the last year. And uh, mm. you know, basically, they're 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 having a hangover from uh, a uh, COVID party, right? And mm -hmm. you know, Pfizer Pfizer, along with their partner BioNTech, had a great 2020, 21, 22, thanks to uh, selling COVID vaccines mm -hmm. and and COVID treatments and. Now sales of that have come off rapidly, and the market doesn't like it, and uh, has uh, has uh, you know guidance and stuff has come down. But you know, it's it, I think in December it traded at a 10-year low. Mm -hmm. This is a global leader in pharmaceuticals, you know, over 50 billion dollars of sales, and uh, you know pays a six percent dividend as a dividend aristocrat. And you know, I would argue it's close, close to bottoming. You, mm -hmm. you know, when stocks are in a downtrend, like it's a very momentum-driven market right now, and so it's hard to, to hard to pick a bottom. But uh, you know, to me, at, at, at 15 times earnings and uh, uh, or 12 times earnings actually, and a, a six percent dividend yield, it's pretty compelling here. And uh, uh, you know, if you take X out the the COVID uh, part of the portfolio, which is about I think they're saying eight billion dollars this year. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the portfolio is is growing at roughly a five percent rate. They just made a big acquisition last year, CGen, to augment uh, four new products uh, in in the sales channel for uh, cancer, and they've got about a mm -hmm. dozen new uh, cancer va uh, cancer products uh, in development. And so uh, we actually think this is pretty good. And you compare it with something like an Eli Lilly, which trades at like 70, 80 times earnings. That uh, you know, our you know, GLP ones are great, but you know, mm -hmm. again. How much of that is already factored in? They've factored in many years of growth into something like Lilly, whereas this thing's getting mm -hmm. thrown out. And you know, I'd argue it's uh, it's a good opportunity. Okay, yeah, that was a huge acquisition, though. CGen, forty-three billion dollars yeah, US very big. to get big in cancer. Um, and then Kiera, this feeds into your theme of some of these second-tier energy players you feel are undervalued. Yeah, yeah, and this is you know it, it, it's not a tiny company, but yeah, no, they, no. they're they're a key infrastructure provider in, in Western Canada of. of Natural gas, uh, natural gas plants, pipelines, uh, uh, Fort Saskatchewan uh, fractionation plant, and storage, uh, natural gas and liquid storage. Uh, like they own really key important infrastructure. If they, they weren't weren't there, the industry would be in, in, in uh, difficult times with a bunch of areas. And so, this is just a great key infrastructure for for the industry. It trades at just 15 times earnings and about six percent dividend yield. It's actually got one of the stronger balance sheets in this area. Less. The leverage on this one is only roughly around uh, two and a half times, which for an uh, infrastructure type company is very low. And you know they, they've increased their dividend pretty well every year for the last you know ten years or whatever. And so it's uh, and we look for that to continue. We think it's a, it's a great opportunity here. Could we? I, we've less than a minute. Could we see private equity buying infrastructure players like this? Do well, you think? good. And, and you know, great example. Like you know, who's the best known infrastructure player in Canada? Brookfield. Brookfield. And and you know they they bought bought one of our holdings two years ago in Interpipe. Oh yeah, yeah. Same same similar type of business. Great key infrastructure. And again, the market, the public markets for some reason, and again, it's just this distaste for anything to do with oil and gas. Mm -hmm. Uh, have abandoned these sectors and leave them at really low valuations. And so when a private player comes along, they can look at it and go, we can pay a 30, 40% premium on these things and still make them very compelling valuation because they're just great assets. Alex, great talking to you and thanks very much indeed. Oh, thank you for having me. Paul's first idea is Stryker, the medical devices company. 
Right, so we've owned Stryker for a long time. I, we think it's a great story. Um, you know, they make uh, hips replacements, all hip, spine, ankles, uh, hands sort of thing. So so one of the reasons we like this company is because, you know, medical devices is a very important area of, of, the, of the whole medical area. And I think it really keeps people at a hospital. So there's a couple of things. One is if a doctor uses one of these products, they tend to use the same one. So there's a bit of an annuity from that perspective and a demographic play because as people are getting older, they, this quality of life really helps them. And you saw in there, and, and there's also because of COVID, there's a huge backlog on the on, on, on these surgeries because they were elective. So I think the backlog has been, has been caught up, but you know, their numbers came out, they had a, almost a 12% or a growth in revenue. They had, their margins were at 63.7% for the year and for the quarter and, and you know, 19 or 20% uh, on operating margins. So it's a great company that gets great margins, great operating margins. 73% uh, of their business is the United States, but the rest of it is uh, the developed world about 20% and the rest of it in, in emerging markets. So there's lots of growth internationally for them. So we really like it. We think that, uh, you know, they can do some tuck on acquisitions and uh, medical devices really makes a big difference in people's lives. So I think that more and more people can use this to have a better quality of life down the road as you get older. So we really like it. We think that it will continue to do well here. Um, and um, I think that their, their numbers were uh, great for the quarter. I think they're just going to get better down the road. Okay, your next idea is Visa. We usually ask people not to reuse the past pick as a top pick, but this one snuck through. Right. Uh, Visa, go yes. ahead, Paul. Yeah, so Visa, as I said earlier on, is a great, it's a toll booth. They just kind of, every time you use a Visa, they get paid for it. So one of the things that it, it got hurt uh, during that COVID period because people start traveling. Traveling is a big part of their revenue growth. So that's going to continue in the next several years, although travel may slow down, not as much as it was in 2023, but I think travel will be will be relatively strong. The other thing is this B2B area, which I talked about with PayPal, more and more smaller companies are going to be able to use Visa to pay for a lot of their their bills, and and with a lot of loyalty programs, you know, people tend to want to use their credit cards on a regular basis, so that helps out a lot. So I think that's where it is. I think there's also great growth internationally with Visa uh, because people think it's it's you know it's a very international company. It is, but there's still a lot of people that use cash, and I think especially in kind of the uh, you know the developing world. So 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 I think there's a lot of opportunity for Visa down the road, um, and I think it's a it's a great story and it's a very simple story in many ways. It just generates so much free cash. Uh, so, and I think Visa has been very good at looking at other like things like PayPal and how they are affecting their business and buying things and thinking about technology. So they're they're on the right track to 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 to, uh, to do well over the in the future. And finally, Essilor Luxottica, huge player in eye care globally. Right, so Essilor is a uh, it's, it's two companies that got put together. Essilor was the French uh, 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 glass company. Exotica was the kind of uh, uh, the frame business, effectively. Uh, so they're it's a great business. Uh, they, you know, obviously again, people are using so much screen time, so their eyes get worse. So they, they tend to be uh, use go, go to glasses a lot. Glasses tend to be much more fashionable thing these days, so people use them. Um, they bought a company called Grand Vision, which is really dramatically changing their their business. So people probably know this because they own uh, they own Oakley. They they do third party stuff for Dior and all these other companies. And on top of that, they own Sunglass Hut. So from a retail perspective, people will know the name because of that. But they are they were they are way ahead on technology on the glass side with Essilor, and and then they have this great uh, frame business through like Exotica. Uh, so uh, it's a great story. I think that you know as people also an aging population, people tend to use glasses more. Mm -hmm. So there's all that with it, and so you get. To, I think you know it's a great story, and I think Grand Vision is going to really help them over the next several years on the revenue side. Yeah, is it ever a growth uh, a growth industry with uh, all of our eyesight failing? Yeah, yeah, and it's it really is happening a lot, like especially with younger kids, because it was never happening before. But you know, kids are using screens a lot more, so they're they're moving to glasses a lot faster than probably our my generation would be, right? That's interesting, Paul. Let's um, let's leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. First idea is Compass Group. It trades in London. Can you remind us what they do, Lauren? Sure. Compass is in the exciting business of catering, so they supply. Ah. Food courts, hospitals, schools, sports stadiums, um, offshore drilling rigs, defense, like all, all of this stuff. 
Um, but it's been an incredible growth company. Their revenues are growing at, you know, between eight and 10% per year. Uh, huge free cash flow, and the trend is more and more companies want to outsource their food food supply to all of this. So every food court in Toronto probably uses Compass Group as an mm -hmm. example. And so they're generating free cash flow. It's still a very fragmented industry. They're the largest. 60% of their revenues are in the U.S. But honestly, if you look at the financials, the growth is akin somewhat to that of a high-flying tech company. Mm -hmm. Double-digit earnings growth, trading at 23 times earnings, uh, dividend yield of over 2%. It's uh, for us a compelling, uh, compelling story. It happens to be in Europe. No one's heard of it, even though they're the largest in North America. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. So they're pretty global, or at least very oh, international. Yeah. Very. Okay. The next idea, Nike. So Nike shares were $175 two and a half years ago. Um, the stock cratered uh, over the last couple of years, um, partly because of slowing sales in China little bit of competition, but they remain the largest footwear and largest sportswear company in the world. Such an iconic brand. Uh, margins are picking up because they're selling more and more Nike uh, merchandise through their own stores, their own website, their own app. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, this lull is the opportunity to buy one of those iconic brands um, with phenomenal profit margins. Um, and Nike should return to double-digit growth uh, next year. Um, and, and therefore, you know, here's the opportunity. Here's one of those great businesses um, that's simply being ignored by investors. Why has it come down so much? So it's come down partly because of slowdown in China. Mm -hmm. um, it's come down because, uh, in general, uh, higher interest rates knock down sales somewhat, in, you know, consumer discretionary spending. And so they've gone through a year of flat revenues, roughly. 2024 will be a flat revenue year. But they're investing their free cash flow uh, in, in reinvigorating everything they do. They're also, you know, they're paying a 1.5% dividend. Dividends growing, buying back shares, huge free cash flow, and they are the best. There's, they're, they're that brand. Yeah, you think it's sufficiently entrenched among young people in particular? It's entrenched everywhere. Every you know, NFL football game, FIFA, like you know, the Nike swoosh is one of the most recognized logos in the world. They're a fifty billion dollar a year business, and uh, lots of room for growth. And they've also been able to grow organically. Uh, they've only made one ac major acquisition in the last twenty years, and that was Converse. So this has been a really an organic growth story. We're going to get the, um, the Olympics in Paris this year. Correct. And I'm especially excited about breakdancing. Not that yeah. I'm a breakdancer, <laughs> not that I'm a breakdancer, but I just think that's amazing. I think it's great. Uh, how, how do you evaluate that? I guess the judges will be trained. It's going to be a bit like ice dancing or something. And of course, it's always going to be questionable. Are the judges playing favorites or exactly. not? Exactly. But uh, I kind of like that. Um, I'd like to see more sports that people actually play. I know people always make fun of rhythmic gymnastics or something. Well, well yeah. I'm a squash player, Andy, and I think in the following Olympics or so, squash has, be, has become, will become an Olympic sport. Oh, it's not in there now. Squash. It's not in there now, but it has been approved for 2028 or something like that. Oh, that's amazing it's not in there yeah. now because it's huge in, in India, for example. Yeah. Many yeah. places. But the breakdancing, I mean, just, I love watching it. Not that I'll ever be a I wonder if they'll be wearing Nike shoes. Who knows? Yeah, oh, I bet Nike will be right in there. Yeah. And then finally, Starbucks, another great global brand. Uh, Starbucks, and so Starbucks has been weak. Uh, China sales are down, and China's a huge market for them. It was 13%, now it's 10%. Listen, S Starbucks is an amazing company because there seems to be no price point at which consumers will not pay <laughs> for a, a pumpkin spiced chai latte. <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I myself, I'm an espresso drinker, so when I'm traveling, as I am today, I look for the local Starbucks, and I always say it's the same espresso served to me by the same university student. <laughs> the, the service is amazing. They've generated so much margin through their app. As you, you walk in there and there's, you know, 25 coffees waiting for people that have ordered already. And they're still growing their revenues at close to 10% per year. And the next two years, we expect their earnings to rise by 25%. Um, so, I mean, again, the stock has been weak and here's the opportunity and there is no one like them in the world. Why has the stock been weak? It's been weak really because of China. In fact, okay. China's, China's been a huge growth. When I, when I went to China and I, I was shocked 
to find that my espresso in China was more expensive than it is here. Mm. It is uh, considered a huge premium brand and there are, were lineups there. Yeah, the, um, it's, a, it's a huge growing business. Um, actually, there's a headline here uh, yesterday on Bloomberg. S Starbucks won't cut China prices despite losing ground to rivals. So they're trying to maintain a prestige approach, and, I guess. And they've maintained that prestige. And interesting enough, I found in China that even um, Hagen dazs ice cream was trading at a crazy premium price. A lot of these American companies yeah. are trading premium prices, and there's more Starbucks in Shanghai than any city in the world. I, the viewers have heard me tell this story before, but a friend of mine works in a Louis Vuitton boutique in Dublin. And she, in the past, I don't know if she still does it, prevents Chinese people from coming in and buying half a dozen Vuitton bags. She's been told to do that because the game they play is go back and sell them in China at higher prices. I did not know that. Yeah, so obviously Vuitton charges what the market will bear in different countries. Well, hopefully she'll let you buy six Vuitton bags. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> but a Aideen, she's a fairly formid formidable lady and uh, you, wouldn't buy, you wouldn't want to go against her. <laughs> anyway, thanks, thanks very much, Lauren. Always Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it. First idea, Meg Energy, a classic heavy oil play. Yeah, Meg's got a very reserve, a long reserve life, like I mentioned just a second ago. And, you know, I, we think really highly of what Derek Evans has done there. Again, um, if I was going to be critical of him at all, uh, it's just been that we wish we hadn't paid off as much debt. I, you know, I, I, you can see all, all the note purchasing that had gone on the last few years. And um, we, we would have liked to got to our 100% of free cash flow being used uh, for buybacks, uh, you know, <laughs> earlier than this mark. But again, um, I, I, I think Meg sits in very kind of a virtuous place where they have this great asset, they're producing wonderful cash flows, and we're not going to be paying cash taxes for years. Um, the question might be who wants to come in and take that advantage away from us by paying us a premium now. And that would be where the, the majors should be stepping in <laughs> and giving Derek a call and, and trying to coo in his ear. Right. Um, of course, the former Husky Energy was sniffing around, uh, apparently, but uh, that it never cool. came cool. to anything. Uh, but you think it's exactly. an, attra uh, an attractive potential takeout asset anyway? Yeah, because you could fund the deal premium off of the NOLs uh, that, that you could um, that you wouldn't have to pay ta cash taxes on. So right. if you have a like asset um, that you could produce off and, and just to throw out a plausible possible scenario, Synovus could be a buyer. They could use... Uh, their existing mm -hmm. operations there to um, effectively save on taxes and fund the deal premium out of that over the first few years. Um, so that, that mm -hmm. I mean, it's just that that money would be recognized quicker by a larger company than it would be recognized by Meg and mm -hmm. NOLs as we move forward. Your next idea is Adam Waters's company, Waters, the famed financier, uh, Strathcona Resources. Yeah, so we were actually running some analysis, Andrew, the other day in dollar terms uh, on Strathcona. And this is, um, I'll, I'll also say that, uh, that uh, Adam is gonna be coming to our Investor Oasis Monday here in Phoenix um, to speak with our investors. And as we were putting together some of the slides, we looked at the fact that as you buy their stock today in the open market, uh, in dollar in US dollar terms, I think we, we, you're paying about $18 uh, US for that stock today. And what you're getting in flowing barrels, uh, value uh, the value of flowing barrels, is you're getting about $52 per share of flowing barrels, okay? Um, you will have trouble finding that relationship of flowing barrel value relative to stock price in the Canadian space today. Uh, admittedly, the, the biggest knock on the stock is there's such very little that's publicly traded. Mm -hmm. And one of the former Pipestone holders, uh, GMAT uh, 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 out of Atlanta, they yeah. own so much of the shares and they're not selling their shares yet. So just very tight liquidity that keeps bigger investors out of it. Uh, if you're a small Canadian investor, retail investor, that's opportunity for you that big institutions can't take. Right, yeah. Were they the ones who objected to the deal? I'm trying to remember. I think one Pipestone uh, investor wasn't happy. Oh, okay. Correct, correct. Uh, and then finally, Synovus Energy. We talked about them before, but just remind us why you like this name. Yeah, we uh, Synovus has been treated poorly, like I mentioned earlier, as, as spreads open. You'd think that Synovus was subject to the spreads in a meaningful way when in reality is the crack spread can be their margin opportunity on the refinery side. So we don't totally understand why the market has disliked uh, so much of this in the interim on Synovus. Um, we think Synovus is attractively priced. Uh, you know, we, we've been out there in the market on it more recently. 
Um, and so we we very much like the business. We think they have the ability to go out and, and leverage and consolidate. Um, you got to remember, uh, Mr. McKenzie, he was the person that put together the Husky deal. Um, and so we loved that deal. That's how we got involved with Synovus was via the Husky side to arbitrage the deal spread. Um, here we wake up today and we would love uh, uh, John to go out and, and flex that same muscle. They've done a lot of really good things to improve the spreads and the quality of their uh, you know, their, their upstream to downstream assets. Um, and and they, they, they've captured a lot in the last two years there. And we think it's time to go continue to find more upstream supply. And that's where we want them to go to take advantage of that. Um, what, what other thing I'll mention, Andrew, mm-hmm. I, I've now realized why Eric Natal is skinnier than me because <laughs> he's done this a lot of times and, and he must get a huge workout because you, you, you've exhausted me. <laughs> okay, it, uh, we uh, we draw a lot of information from our guests. Yeah, Cole, it was really yep. cool having you on the show, and thank you very much. I hope you have time to come back soon on Market Call. Thank you, Cole Smead, uh, making his Market Call debut. We love to hear from you. Please email us anytime at marketcall at BNN Bloomberg. <laughs> 